good evening everyone so we are back to magnetism and magic i'll tell you a few things before we start today's topics okay this chapter has two parts first part is about bar magnet bar magnet do you remember what a bar magnet is you know a bar magnet the same thing you use in a school laboratory all right it has a north pole as well as a south pole right north pole and south pole all right and we learned about few things of bar magnet if you keep a bar magnet suspended on a fiber it will stay aligned in north south direction correct okay north south direction. you just keep a magnet suspended freely on a fiber it will turn a bit it will eventually stay in north south direction got it actually this knowledge was used by sailors in navigation right compass needle magnetic compass needle it will always show even the mobile phones have digital mag compass needle right okay so it always shows a particular direction okay so magnet bar magnet shows directive property there is something called directive property it always shows north south direction another thing is there is something called magnetic field line which we draw they are from where to where north pole to south pole outside north pole to south pole while inside they are coming back to north pole so they form closed to loops like this okay unlike in electric dipole electric dipole they start from positive they end on negative but they'll never come back to positive correct they don't form closed loops correct so i can draw any number of lines i want these are magnetic field lines magnetic field lines magnetic field lines are imaginary lines right okay there are few things magnetic field lines cannot intersect because if they intersect what would happen if lines intersect at the point of intersection you can draw yes you can draw two tangents which means there will be two directions that will never happen right okay so magnetic field lines can never intersect then another point is you can draw the tangent to get the direction tangent gives the direction tangent gives the direction tangent gives the direction everywhere the magnetic field direction is given by tangent all right tangent then the last point closer the field lines stronger the field and vice versa here the field lines are closer right because the field is stronger there right but as you can see here the lines are far apart because it is weaker away from the magnet all right then i told you if you break a magnet into two you won't get north and south separately all right you will have two brand new magnets north and south north and south all right because isolated monopoles do not exist monopole means what mono means single single poles do not exist they whenever they come they come together come in pairs or they come in couple all the time understood north and south they stay together right so that is a summary of what we learned in the first part of the chapter okay i repeat that point one more time look at this we learned about bar magnet in the last class bar magnet bar magnet has a north pole and a south pole right north pole and south pole as you can see bar magnet has a north pole as well as south pole all right if you break a magnet you won't have north pole and south pole separately instead both the pieces will have north pole and south pole but the strength will be less because it's half the magnet now right okay second thing i told you it always shows directive property when you suspend it on a fiber it will always align itself along north south direction okay then about this magnetic field lines are drawn from north pole to south pole outside the magnet they are from north pole to south pole inside the magnet they are from south pole to north pole i can draw one more like this like this outside the magnet they are from north pole to south pole inside it is from south pole to north pole okay remember the lines can never intersect the lines can never meet because if they meet that would mean that they have two directions right that is never for field has two directions that is never possible right then field lines are closer field is stronger and vice versa okay that's it that is the first part of it all right no 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 actually inside the magnet these dipoles are aligned atomic dipoles are aligned in a particular direction that is the next point i am telling you okay ah, right so that is where we start the class today now imagine i'll tell you something imagine you take an atom look at an atom this is an atom 
atom has a central core called nucleus, right? Nucleus. And an electron is revolving. If an electron revolves in clockwise direction, where is current flowing? Current flows in anti-clockwise direction, right? Because electrons direction and current direction are opposite to each other. Look at this. This is the direction of current. Just imagine the current direction is this way, anti-clockwise. Anti-clockwise means what? Do you remember this from last chapter? You draw N here, put an arrow at the tip, move that arrow onto the ring. Anti-clockwise current corresponds to North Pole. Correct. And South Pole is what? Clockwise current. Clockwise current is South Pole. Got it. So on the atom, if you look from this side, current is anti-clockwise. So that is North Pole, right? If you go over to the other side, it is clockwise. That is South Pole. So what is my point here? Every atom is equal to a magnet. Understood? Every atom behaves like a magnet. We can call it atomic magnet. Most fundamental unit of magnetism. All right. That is the best point of today's discussion. I repeat the point one more time. I take an atom. I take an atom. Say, let us say hydrogen atom. It is the simplest atom. Hydrogen atom. Okay. Hydrogen atom has only one proton and one electron. No neutron, right? And imagine electron is revolving. Electron revolves. That will create a current. Correct. It is a circulating current, right? Revolving current is like a magnet. There will be a magnetism. Atom behaves like a magnet. All right. So if you take a magnetic substance, magnetic substance, this is a magnetic substance. All right. You know, Take these atomic magnets are aligned in a particular direction. Particular direction. What if they are randomly aligned? What if they are randomly aligned? The net dipole moment will be zero. Imagine children are run randomly running. Few students are running into the classroom. Few others are running out of the classroom. Got it. What is the change in number of students? Zero. Because whenever it is random, we give equal chance for both. Correct. Correct. We would assume that if five students are coming in, five students are going out, right? All of a sudden, if I fall unconscious, I have equal chance of falling to the right, falling to the left. Correct. When I buy a lottery, I have equal chance of winning and losing, right? Same way. Understood. So, it is like, if it is random orientation, if these, at these are all atoms, these are all atomic magnets, all right? If they are all randomly aligned, net to value will be what? Zero. But what if they are regularly aligned? They are in an order, no? They are in a particular direction, right? It has a net magnetism, isn't it? Correct. It is having some magnetism. How do you have this magnetism? Take an iron nail, rub it on a magnet for some time. That will become a magnet, right? Correct. Or take a magnet, iron nail, put it inside a magnetic field, that will become a magnet. You know MRI scanning machine? MRI scanning machines, no? In hospitals, they are supposed to be having largest magnets in the world. Okay. Really, really heavy magnets. That is why even chairs will be pulled inside. Understood? Understood? So strong. But if you put something inside, that will be magnetized. Or if you take an iron nail and if it is if you, if it is buried underground, after some time, it will become a magnet. Because earth has magnetic properties. Alright. There are many ways to magnetize a material. Alright. You can rub it on a magnet for some. I will show you now. You can rub it on a magnet for some time, all right? Or you can keep it in touch with a magnet, understood? Or you can keep it inside a magnetic field. Anyway, when you do that, it gets a magnetism, right? And I'm taking the total dipole moment to total volume of the substance. That ratio is going to be called M dash. What is M dash? This M dash has a name. It is called magnetization. So magnetization, M dash is what? It is capital letter M divided by volume. It is magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. Magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. I have written the notes strictly as per the reader. So you don't have to learn even an extra word. Trust me on that, I promise. All right, not even an extra word. I have included even the previous questions. Okay. So, this is what the total magnetic moment. So, see the situation sequence one more time. I take an atom. In an atom, electrons are revolving. So, current is flowing. That creates a magnetism, right? An atom is a magnet. That is our first point. 
an atom is a magnet so we got so many atoms aligned in a direction not random orientation random means net value will be zero correct so these are all aligned in a direction so they have a net moment net magnetism so net magnetic moment by volume is called magnetization that is first point second point imagine the scenario we take a solenoid what is the equation for magnetic field of a solenoid magnetic field inside a solenoid is given by mu zero times ni if you let a current pass through this do you know what a magnetic solenoid is you take a plastic pipe look at this look at this you take a plastic pipe okay wind wires over it this is called a solenoid got it it is called an air cord solenoid air cord what is meant by air cord its core is air inside it is air if i insert a iron core it becomes iron cord solenoid i can insert copper core copper cord solenoid aluminium core aluminium cord solenoid understood so depend depending upon requirements and applications we will insert different types of cores got it so anyway for an air cord solenoid if you let a current pass through it it has to be a conductor all right it has to be a conductor. then only magnetic effect will be there right and this is how the magnetic field lines are drawn inside a magnet magnetic field lines are drawn this way to be precise you have to draw it this way like this but outside you know concentration is very less compared to inside got it so outside we don't consider at all most of the for a solenoid most of the magnetism is concentrated inside for a solenoid most of the magnetism is concentrated inside just like this i'll show you this is something different but i'll show you look at this i'll just show you see this um so this is actually a case of bar magnet being inserted look at this look at this you can introduce a bar magnet here most of the magnetism will be concentrated near the core as you can see right same way if you look at it see the circles no that is how the magnetic field is going to be concentrated so if you look at a solenoid all the lines are inside right so for a solenoid we can write mu zero times ni as magnetic field this ni will be called h that will be called as h now i'll tell you what h is b0 is equal to mu zero times h that h is called magnetic intensity magnetic intensity okay magnetic intensity i'll explain the points one more time listen to me this is very important the complex part is over all right rest of it is very easy all right almost one more time look at this look at this so i go back from the sequence one more time go back to the sequence first you know every atom is equivalent to a magnet all right it is called an atomic magnet atom has atomic magnetic moment all right and you take a substance this is called bulk material in a bulk material all the atoms are regularly ordered regularly arranged if that is the case this substance has a net magnetism got it you take that dipole moment divide that with volume what you are getting is called magnetization magnetization secondly you know i told you about a solenoid solenoid it is an air cord solenoid to be to be precise like a pipe air inside it's hollow inside right okay air cord solenoid then what then magnetic field is given by mu zero times ni ni will be called h that ni will be called h okay and i is called h yes, it is called magnetic intensity now why should i define these two terms because i am going to take the ratio of those two look at that the ratio of m dash to h that ratio is called chi or susceptibility this is called magnetic susceptibility susceptibility most of the portions in between are deleted so it is difficult to understand what it is but i'll tell you in simple words what is susceptibility susceptibility if the susceptibility is large that means it is easily magnetizable understood it tells you how fast a substance can be magnetized got it if chi is small that means it is very difficult to magnetize it got it so chi is what chi is susceptibility 
it is a term that tells you how fast a substance responds to a magnetic field. How easily a specimen can be magnetized. Understood? If chi is large, easily magnetizable. Chi is small, very difficult to magnetize it. Why should I tell you? Because I'm going to tell you the classification now. There are basically three types of magnetic materials. First one is called diamagnetic material. Diamagnetic. Second one is called paramagnetic material. Paramagnetic. Third one is called ferromagnetic materials. That's the end of the chapter, okay? Diamagnetic, paramagnetic, and ferromagnetic materials. There are three types of materials. Dia, para, ferro. Got it? There are two more in the chapter textbook. At the end, there is something called points to ponder. There they have written two more types, anti-ferromagnetic and ferrimagnetic. But they are not there in syllabus now. Understood? It is learned at higher levels only. Okay. So at your level, at your level, trust me, the question will be based on these three types of materials. Okay. So what is the classification? Diamagnetic materials, paramagnetic materials, ferromagnetic materials. Dia, para, ferro. What is diamagnetic materials? Weak repulsion. Substances which undergo weak repulsion. That means when you put a substance inside a magnetic field, if it is repelled, if it is repelled, such a substance is called diamagnetic. But repulsion will be very weak. I'll show you now. Repulsion will be very weak. Diamagnetic substances are weakly repelled. Those who are repelled very weakly. Now, what about paramagnetic? It is weakly attracted. Weak attraction. Weak attraction. What is ferromagnetic then? It is strong attraction. It is ferromagnetic is in fact a stronger version of paramagnetic substances. Got it? All right. Now we'll learn different questions from previous papers. Okay. I repeat one more time. You know, there are basically five types of magnetic materials. Diamagnetic materials, paramagnetic materials, ferromagnetic materials, then ferry and antiferro. Ferry and antiferro, you don't have to learn. Okay. So for the moment, we will focus on these three types of materials. Okay. So what is diamagnetic material? Substances which show weak repulsion. Weak repulsion. They will be repelled. When you put it in a magnetic field, they will be repelled. Got it. And paramagnetic, weak attraction. All right. It will be attracted, but very weakly. Got it. Stronger attraction is for ferromagnetic. I'll tell you one previous question. This is a north pole. This is a south pole. I put a watch glass on top of it. Watch glass is like a glass vessel. Okay. And I put a powder on it. Powder on it. The powder takes this form. All right. What kind of powder is this? This is diamagnetic powder. Why? This is the strong region, right? Why? Between the poles, the magnetic field is strong. Right? So where does the powder go? Powder is repelled here, right? The moment you put the powder, the powder gets repelled, right? Correct. So that is what? Repulsion happens for diamagnetic material. Now, if same thing happens with para, this is how it will look like. The same wash glass, you know, the powder will come heaped closer to the center. Because towards center, the field is strong, right? You know, powder will come closer to the stronger field. It is attraction. What about ferromagnetic? I had told you that it is a stronger version of paramagnetic. So that heaping up will be more. It will come much closer to this. Understood? So this is the best example to understand dia para ferro. So just have a picture of this in mind. Dia it's a previous question. Diamagnetic material. If you put a powder in a watch glass or a vessel, this is a watch glass or a vessel, and you put it on two pole pieces, north pole and south pole. Okay. So here, the powder will go out like this. The powder goes away. Goes away means it's moving away from a strong region to weak region. Right. This is strong region in between the poles. It is a strong region. Correct. Strong to weak. It must be what? Diamagnetic material. Now, whereas this is what? The moment you put the powder, the moment you put the powder, that will come closer towards center. Correct. That will come closer towards center. Why? Because it is attraction. It's coming closer to the field. Isn't it? Correct. But in the next case, you know, that, that powder comes much, much closer in a stronger way. In a stronger way. 
because magnetic field is stronger in this region. All right. So weak attraction, weak repulsion, weak attraction, strong attraction. Got it. And it is clearly from the fact that you take what? This is the most repeated question here. Here, chi is small, negative. Chi is small, negative. Here, chi is small, positive. Here, chi is large, positive. That makes sense, right? Why? Because chi is small. Why small? I said weak repulsion, right? Correct. Chi is in fact what? It tells you how easily a substance can be magnetized. Correct. Chi is less means weak magnetization. Chi is more means strong magnetization. Understood? Chi is small because I said diamagnet has weak magnetization, right? Para, that is also weak magnetization, right? Ferro is strong magnetization. Now, why is this negative? I said repulsion, right? Correct. Diamagnetic repulsion, paramagnetic attraction, positive. Ferromagnetic also attraction, positive. Got it. Now, let me show you something now. I'll, well, let's see this. See this? You know, we have like, hmm, look at this. First, they are going to pour liquid nitrogen inside a magnetic field. Liquid nitrogen, okay? Uh, there is more. Uh, when I have a question. Okay, now see this. We have a magnetic field here. Look at that. This is a north pole, south pole pair, right? And you're, you're going to pour liquid nitrogen into this. Liquid nitrogen won't stay there. It will be repelled. Why? Liquid nitrogen is diamagnetic. Got it. But see what happens with liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is paramagnetic. That will be attracted. That will stay inside. Just see that. First you are pouring liquid nitrogen. That is liquid nitrogen. Is it staying there? No. That actually went through the gap. You didn't see that. Okay, it actually went down through the gap, isn't it? Right. So, see what happens when you liquid oxygen, when you drop liquid oxygen, put liquid ox oxygen, stays there in the magnetic field, right? Correct. Correct. Stays there, right? Because it's being attracted. Got it. All right. Hope you understood this. I'll show you one more thing now. Now, this video is lengthy, in fact, but it tells you the clear differences between diaparaferro. I'm not thinking of water as being magnetic, but it is. And so are graphite, aluminum, and glass. This is a new and different category of magnetism called either para or diamagnetism, and it's different from the magnetism that you're used to. You're probably already familiar with ferromagnetism. Means no magnetism now. Put it in a magnet. It's magnetized. Right. Did you see that? Initially, the iron nail had no magnetization, right? Correct. But when it was kept in contact with the magnet, all of a sudden it became a magnet. Got it. Even after removing the magnet, the magnetism still stays. Yeah. Right. Right. And even after the magnet is removed. Look at that. Still stays, right? It's similar effect, except that it's much weaker. And now they are doing with different things there, different substances. Look at that, aluminum. See that it's moving away. Can you see it moving away? Aluminum, it's moving away, right? Moving away means it's repulsion. Correct. Correct. Aluminum is being repelled because aluminum is diamagnet. Which one? Ah, it's being attracted. So, sorry. So right. oxygen. Attraction is paramagnetic, right? Here, a few milliliters of liquid oxygen which sticks to the magnets. I'll explain why. Look at that. Gallium oxide and cupric sulfate are good examples of paramagnetic. Again, substances. paramagnetic, being attractive, right? Sulfate is a salt that can be picked up by a magnet. You can pick it up. You can pick it up using magnets then because they'll be attracted, right? Right. Sure. Exactly the opposite of the paramagnetic. They are always repulsed. They would rather die than be in a magnetic field. An important example of a diamagnetic material is graphite. This specially made pyrolytic graphite is repelled by a magnetic field. Don't be confused. This is not static being repelled, right? electricity or eddy currents. Graphite, graphite is being repelled. Is repelled by it's diamagnetic. Always, both by the north and south end. 
the results are quite surprising because you don't expect these substances to have I magnetism, right? Grown crystal with a black carbon layer, which maximizes the diamagnetic effect. That principle is coming up. I'll okay. tell you about it. The best is superconductor. Superconductors. Do you know what superconductors are? Superconductors, superbly conducting, no resistance at all. Okay. It was first observed by Kammerling Ons, a Swedish scientist. He brought the temperature of mercury down to 4 Kelvin, 4.2 Kelvin, minus 269 degrees Celsius. Okay. And he found that mercury is absolutely superconducting. That means mercury has no resistance at all. Understood? Yeah. That is called superconductivity. Superconductivity. Superconductors are all perfectly diamagnetic. All superconductors are perfectly diamagnetic. All right. So this, I'll tell you about it. Superconductors. See this? And how do they make superconductor? They'll take the magnet, they'll they'll take the substance, they'll put it in liquid nitrogen. They'll supercool it. Supercool it. You have to supercool it to make it superconductor. Got it. I'll tell you about it. There is a thing called maglev train, which works on this principle. I'll show you. The most famous and powerful diamagnetic is bismuth, element number 83 on the periodic scale. The bismuth power boat sails toward the weaker magnetic field. If you suspend a magnetic substance like that, if it aligns in the direction of magnetic field, that will be either para or ferro along the direction, right? But if it aligns perpendicular to the field, that is like it is trying to escape, right? Correct. It is diamagnetic. So if it aligns in the direction, it will be either para or ferro. If it aligns perpendicular to the field, that should be diamagnetic substance. Look at that. Look at that. So you're going to suspend. Like glass will rotate to avoid magnets. Here, we see that the glass is diamagnetic. Look at that. It stays perpendicularly, right? Correct. Because it is trying to escape out of the field, isn't it? But look at that. Stays parallel to the field, right? This is north pole, that is south pole, isn't it? So what does it take to understand what it means for something to be a paramagnet or a diamond? You have to know what the electrons are doing. Consider, for example, aluminum. Aluminum is being received from the period. Oh, that is the principle of this, but I'm not able to skip it here. That's 2s. Okay, so let me see the thing. One more thing I have to tell you. Diamagnetic substances. There is another way of identifying diamagnetic substances. Look at this. If you keep a diamagnetic substance inside a magnetic field, the field lines are repelled or expelled. Field lines won't pass through it. All right. Field lines won't pass through it. Because there is repulsion, right? Okay. How about paramagnetic substance? Few of the field lines will pass through it, while few will pass outside. While for ferromagnetic substances, all the lines will pass through, will pass through inside, will pass inside. Understood? So, look at this again. Diamagnetic substances, diamagnetic substances have no lines passing through them because all the lines are being expelled, expelled or repelled. Correct? But in the case of para, few lines would pass inside, whereas in the case of ferro, all the lines will be converged inside the material substance. Got it? That is one way of identifying them. All right. Dia, para, and ferro. Dia, para, and ferro. I'll tell you a few previous questions. But anyway, superconductors, I told you, superconductors, as I told you, superconductors are perfectly conducting, perfectly conducting, no resistance at all. Absolutely resistance-less conductors. Understood? Such conductors are called superconductors. Got it? They have zero resistance. Got it? Superconductors are perfectly diamagnetic all the time. Never ever forget this. It is one of the most important statements in the reader. Superconductors are perfectly diamagnetic. So they would expel all the field lines. All the field lines. This phenomenon is no, known as Meissner effect. Meissner effect. So they might ask a question here. What is Meissner effect? 
you should say superconductors are perfectly diamagnetic superconductors are perfectly diamagnetic so they expel all the field lines or they repel all the field lines this phenomenon is called meissner effect which is used in maglev trains do you know what maglev trains are magnetically levitated trains magnetically levitated trains okay they are already in operation on a test trial basis in japan and germany they already run at say 600 plus kilometer per hour and it is believed that they can attain a speed of 3500 kilometer per hour all right because they don't touch the rails the train you know it doesn't touch the rail it stays suspended in air since it moves in air no friction no friction understood so it's basically working on this principle maglev trains works on maglev trains work on meissner effect meissner effect all right but they are not they are using some other technology for it okay they are not using super cooling it instead they use another technology for this now but basic idea remains the same maglev trains i'll show you something now look at this uh look at this just give me a second this this is maglev train okay sure one second sorry see this now Actually, it is like a ceramic substance. Ceramic means what? The same material used for floor tiles okay. or the plates you use at home, no? Plates. Okay, right. And basically, it looks like a ceramic material and you supercool it by putting it inside liquid nitrogen. Then it has like superconducting capacity. Understood? So, see what happens. And I'll tell you. On the way, I'll tell you. Right. Well, I mean, it's like floating down a railway somewhere near here in the not too distant future. We make a superconducting magnetic levitation train, or a maglev. So, in other words, we got a hoverboard. Well, here it is. Look at a that. Superconductor. Cool down Did you see that? Moment. It's actually not touching the rails. It's staying suspended, and it can go really quick. But one problem that we face here is it lacks stability. It's it's fluctuating a lot. Understood. So, in order to eliminate that problem, what they do is they'll put it on the track and then supercool it. Understood. Instead of supercooling it and putting it on the track, they'll put the material on track, then supercool it. So it can memorize that location. All right. That's called flux spinning. It's called flux spinning. So it'll have a lot more stability now. See this? See this? This 200 degrees shooting around the track made it extremely It'll strong. stay glued to the track all the time. The only force slowing it down is air resistance, which means it can zoom around very quickly for quite a long time before it comes to a stop. So, how does that work? Superconductors are a strange kind of material. At ordinary temperatures, they're usually fairly boring, either a regular lump of metal or like this black stuff, and put it near these extractures. There go. Look at that. Degrees. Now this is how that is liquid nitrogen. Same piece of supercon piece of superconductor. Our only work if we cool down. So now it is not magnetic. Okay, as you supercool it, it becomes magnetic. Cool down to minus one hundred and ninety-six degrees. That's liquid nitrogen. nitrogen. So I can just get it out. Okay, and bring it these magnets again. See what and happens now. Stay suspended, right? It's just floating there and. As those strings pass the trees above and below. This strange property is called the Meissner effect. That is called Meissner effect. Works when the superconductor is nice and cold. So, as you can see now, it's just starting to warm up. It's going down, um, right? The Once the temperature comes back to normal, it loses the magnetism. Got it. A boring bit of ceramic. The reason the superconductor can float is related to its density. Anything like water current travels and it'll keep on. Magnetic pole as the magnetism of the superconductor. See this? It acts a bit like a magnetic mirror. The two north poles repel, and thus the superconductor can divide right. and levitate. And the currents keeping it there will float forever and ever. So it'll just keep floating. Well, 
until it loses yes, macro effects, yes. right? So we could use this effect to make our macro train. You get the superconductor and just pop it straight onto the track. But sadly, yeah. although it floats nice and high, Look at that. the moisture effect only repels the superconductor from magnets. And so whoop, it's wobbling a lot, in fact. Look at that. Right. So actually, we're going to pull it down a slightly different way. You're going to put it on the track and then. What's in the field of the magnets? That means that it memorizes the magnetic field we're sat in. This is called flux pinning. And by pinning these lines of magnetic force, these lines of flux, the superconductor memorizes this position and doesn't want to move either horizontally or vertically away from it. So when the nitrogen stops boiling, we can just pull out the support. Now look at this. And as you're taking them off, that still stays there, no? Now this time it's got a lot more stability. It's fine. It's a lot more stable. It's fixed in the position that. above the track. So we should be able to make it go. You can go really quick now. See this. Quite a lot faster. Okay, it stays stuck to the track. It should go off on the track. Another fascinating property is that it can even go upside down. Right. It works. That'll stay still stay stuck to the track. Understood. All right, so just write this. First point, first point you have to know is an atom has magnetic moment. An atom has magnetic moment. Every atom behaves like a magnet. Am I correct? Every atom has, every atom has magnetic effect, right? All right. And look at a bulk material. Draw the figure. This is called a bulk material. Okay, bulk substance. Bulk material in which there is some sort of alignment. All the atoms are, atomic dipoles are regularly aligned. What if they are irregularly aligned? Random orientation results in zero magnetization, right? Zero magnetism, right? Net dipole moment would be zero. If it is random orientation for the dipoles, the net moment will be equal to zero. There won't be any magnetism. But we are looking at a material which has the atomic dipoles aligned in a particular direction. All right. So it has a net magnetism, right? So you can write, first thing you can write, magnetization. How do you define magnetization? Magnetization is the net magnetic moment per unit volume. Magnetization is the net magnetic moment per unit volume. Magnetization is the net magnetic moment per unit volume. Okay. Write this magnetization M dash net magnetic moment per unit volume. In the reader, they have used some other letter for it. Okay. Don't worry, I've used M dash here. Okay. I use M for this and small m for this. Okay. Does it make any difference? M dash equal to M by V. Okay. Below which you can write. That is the first point. Second point. Take an air cord solenoid. Air cord solenoid is what? A solenoid with air inside right air inside am i correct okay so just draw the figure this is the solenoid solenoid is like a pipe a pipe on which you're winding coils like this and you are passing a current through this what happens now this is a current carrying solenoid isn't it it's a current carrying solenoid isn't it okay so let us put air cord solenoid you can put Magnetic field is given by what? Magnetic field inside air cord solenoid is mu zero times n into i. Correct. Then this is how I draw the magnetic field line. Magnetic field lines are mostly concentrated inside. Doesn't mean that there is nothing outside. Actually, there are very few lines outside so that we can take it as zero, almost zero. In comparison with inside, magnetic field outside is zero. Got it? That's very feeble. Did you get me? There are few lines. All right. 
So at the end, there will be a curvature for the field line. All right, the lines are bent, little bent over the end. Understood? So there are very few lines over the end, but we won't take them into consideration. Got it? And this Ni, look at this. This N and I together is going to be called H. So let us rewrite it. Let us rewrite it. How do we write? How are we going to write this? B0 is equal to mu0 times H. This H has a name. H is called magnetic intensity. H is called magnetic intensity. So you have defined two terms now. One is magnetization, which is net dipole moment per unit volume. Magnetization is here again, net dipole moment per unit volume, right? And magnetic intensity is H, which is N into I, number density into current. Small letter N is what? Number density, number of turns per unit length. It's total number of turns by total length of the solenoid. Okay, right. That's called number density. Now, as the next point, you can write, you can write next point, susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility. Susceptibility. Chi. This is called Greek letter chi. Chi is what? M dash divided by H. M dash by H. Actually, chi is a number that tells you how fast a substance responds to magnetization. Okay. How fast a substance would respond to magnetization. Or how easily a substance can be magnetized. Understood? The greater than a chi value, the more easily it can be magnetized. Understood? Understood? So you can write, chi is a measure of, measure of how easily a specimen or substance can be magnetized. For example, Ferromagnetic substances are the best ones, right? Okay. They are the easiest ones to be magnetized, right? Okay. All right. They get the maximum magnetization, right? All right. So, which means their chi value is large. Large and positive. Okay. Chi is a measure of or chi tells you how easily a substance can be magnetized. Got it? The greater the value of chi the more easy to get it magnetized. Got it? All right. So, chi value is a measure of how easily a substance can be magnetized. Got it? Now, we'll just write down a couple of things regarding the materials. We'll take a break. Yeah. Now, just write the categories. What are the properties? What are the types of materials? Diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, ferrimagnetic, right? So let us write these diamagnetic. Just draw a tabular column. Diamagnetic, then paramagnetic, then ferromagnetic. Diaparaferro. Let's see one by one. Diaparaferro. Yeah, previous page, sure. Right. So first we defined M dash. Then we defined E H, then we took the ratio of them and that will be called M dash over H is called chi, susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility. How susceptible it is? That's it. Okay. Ah, all right. Hope you finish this. Now just dia, para, ferro. First one. Dia means what? Substances weak, which show weak repulsion. Weak repulsion are Diamagnetic substances, isn't it? Now, substances that show weak attraction, weak repulsion, weak attraction, and the last one is strong attraction. So, substances which show weak repulsion are diamagnetic, weak attraction are paramagnetic, and strong attraction are 
ferromagnetic substances. All right. So now we can write, they move from where to where? Stronger magnetic field to weaker magnetic field. Repulsion means what? Repulsion. Repulsion means it moves from where to where? Strong region to weak region, right? Oh, look at this. This is North Pole, this is South Pole. If you put something here, if it gets repelled, it is moving from which region to which region? Strong field to weak field, right? Strong field to weak field. Correct. So repulsion can be repulsion can be technically given as moving from stronger field to stronger magnetic field to weaker magnetic field, right? Attraction means what? Weaker magnetic field to tell me stronger magnetic field. Here it is the same. I'll write it. That's also from weaker to stronger, but that will be much more stronger than paramagnetic, right? Correct. Got it? Then let us write about the next point, chi value. Chi value is what? Chi value is small. Think of it this way. It is weak. I said weak repulsion, right? I said weak repulsion, right? Weak repulsion, weak attraction, strong attraction. Correct. So this is weak. If I use the word weak, that means magnetization is difficult. Correct. So that means chi value is small. That makes sense, right? Correct. And chi is small, chi is negative as well. Negative. Why negative? Because it is repulsion. Repulsion, we call it negative, right? Chi value is negative. How about this one? I said weak attraction. Weak means chi is again small, just like dia. Got it. But it is attraction, right? Attraction means chi value has to be positive. All right. Next is what? I said strong attraction. Strong means chi value is large. I'll tell you about the values later. It's really large. And it is still positive. So just know one thing. Weak means chi is small. Large means, weak means chi is small and strong means chi is large. Okay. Attraction, chi is positive. Repulsion, chi is negative. Got it? And then that watch glass thing. This is previous question. We are putting a watch glass on a North Pole, South Pole pair. And then if you put some powder on it, the powder takes this form. Look at that. It actually gets repelled. It gets repelled from the middle, right? This region is the strong region, isn't it? Where is the magnetic field strongest? In between the poles, isn't it? Magnetic field is strongest in between the poles, isn't it? Correct. So it gets repelled. The powder gets repelled. The powder gets thrown away from the middle, right? Correct. That happens for a diamagnetic powder. So the powder is diamagnetic. How do they ask the question? They'll give this figure and then they'll ask you to say what kind of a powder is this? Diamagnetic powder, right? Then paramagnetic. This is North Pole. This is South Pole. Again, you put the wash glass. But this time, the powder gets heaped closer to the poles. It's coming closer to the center, right? It's coming closer to the center. It is coming closer to the strong field. That means it must be paramagnetic. Okay. And how about ferromagnetic? How ferromagnetic is like? You know, the, the, the change is clearly visible, right? The powder gets clustered in the middle, right? It's coming closer to the center. Strong attraction. So weak, attra weak repulsion, weak attraction, strong attraction. One more point. Diaparaferro. One more point. The field lines. I told you about field lines. Field lines are expelled by diamagnetic substances. Expelled or repelled by diamagnetic substances. Paramagnetic substances, few of the field lines will pass through. Ferromagnetic substance, there will be convergence of field lines inside. Most of them will Almost all of them will pass through. Dia para ferro. 
okay all right we have few more extra questions to be done cbc questions so this is like dia para ferro and one last thing here i'll tell you a few questions i'll tell you a few questions from this previous questions see this you know diamagnetic substance for example i take a u shaped tube this is a u shaped tube okay and here we have a north pole and a south pole north pole and a south pole look at this look at this north pole and a south pole right inside i keep a liquid i keep a liquid look at this look at this liquid now what will happen to the liquid now the liquid level liquid level gets depressed why it is a diamagnetic liquid right diamagnetic liquid will tend to escape escape from the magnetic field am i correct so the level will go down as it is trying to escape from magnetic field how about this one they won't tell you in school it's a previous question north and south again the u shaped u again the u shaped u i fill a liquid inside look at the liquid here the liquid level look at the liquid here the liquid level liquid level rises why because the liquid is trying to get into the field right get into the field what about the next one there i can write north pole and south pole look at the u shaped tube u shaped tube the liquid level will rise rise again but much stronger than in the previous case am i correct look at the thicker arrow there that arrow, that arrow is drawn intentionally drawn thick, thicker right why there the rising is more in comparison with para ferro is stronger than para am i correct okay so just just you can just write this down this is a liquid this is diamagnetic liquid how do they ask the question it's a previous question again previous question again look at this previous question for diamagnetic liquid look at this it's common sense diamagnetic liquid diamagnetic means weak repulsion say it again weak repulsion so it tends to be repelled repel means it tries to go out of the field am i correct tries to go out of the field this is the field right it tries to escape from the field if it is to escape that level should come down the level gets depressed so how do they ask a question they'll give you this figure they'll ask you to identify the liquid diamagnetic liquid right or they would say the liquid level gets depressed what kind of a liquid is this got it how about paramagnetic paramagnetic you know it is weak attraction weakly attracted right so the level the liquid will try to move into the magnetic field correct it is attracted by the magnetic field there also it is attracted by the magnetic field but in a much stronger way got it got it this is weak repulsion this is weak attraction that is strong attraction got it now we have two more points to write that part is also finished all right this is also a previous question we have a north pole we have a south pole you keep a gas inside this is a gas in a chamber north pole south pole we keep a gas in a chamber inside here also north pole south pole and there is a gas inside the chamber where does the gas expand the gas expands perpendicular to the field that means it comes out of the field tell me why it's trying to escape correct here what do we write here here the gas expands expands out perpendicular to the field okay perpendicular to the field look at the field direction this is the field direction north pole to south pole look at this look at this look at this everyone north pole to south pole north pole to south pole right correct so it tries to escape out of the field so where would it go the gas would come out of the field understood the gas would come out of the field okay the gas would expand perpendicular to the field how about this one gas would expand along the field right gas expands along the field along the field right so if the gas expands along the field it is paramagnetic got it what kind of a gas is this paramagnetic gas diamagnetic gas expands these are previous questions not there in the reader but these are important important points okay diamagnetic substance diamagnetic as think of it this way 
diamagnetic weak repulsion paramagnetic weak attraction ferromagnetic strong attraction all right so diamagnetic gas expands out of the field so expands perpendicular to the field here paramagnetic expands along the field ferromagnetic also expands expands along the field along the field but stronger stronger got it stronger all of you got it? Okay. So these are different cases. These are different questions. Okay. Okay. I'll explain this. This liquid, you know, this liquid is what kind of liquid? Look at the arrow. The arrow is down. Down means the liquid level gets depressed. The liquid level gets depressed means the liquid is trying to go out of the field. The liquid gets repelled, right? So that is diamagnetic liquid. So here the liquid comes into the field. It is attraction. Okay, weak attraction. That is paramagnetic liquid. How about ferromagnetic liquid? That comes much more than that param paramagnetic, right? So that must be ferromagnetic, stronger one, right? So how about this one? If you keep a gas in a chamber inside, the gas expands perpendicular to the field, out of the field, like this, out of the field, that must be diamagnetic gas. If it expands along the field, that must be paramagnetic. If it expands along the direction of field in a stronger way, it must be ferromagnetic. Okay, perpendicular, along the direction, along the direction. That makes sense, right? Because perpendicular means it's going out. Along means it is still trying to stay inside. Correct. Even here it is trying to stay inside. Is that clear now? Okay. Now I'll tell you a couple more points. Look at this. It's finished. Now tell me. Look at this. You should tell me. Imagine I have a north pole and a south pole. Okay. And I suspend a magnet, magnetic piece like this. What happens to this magnet now? It will try to escape, right? It will try to escape means it goes up, right? Correct. It tries to escape. That means it has to go up. Go up means the spring gets compressed. Correct. So the spring is compressed. Spring is compressed. So they would say if the spring gets compressed, what kind of a substance is this? That is a diamagnetic substance. Got it. How about this one? How about this one? North pole and south pole. We have like a spring and a magnetic substance. Here tell me what? This is paramagnetic column, right? Paramagnetic. This column belongs to paramagnetic, which means it will be pulled inside, right? Correct. This will be pulled into the magnetic field, attraction. This will be pulled into the magnetic field, attraction, right? But weak attraction. So I can say spring is elongated or stretched. Look at that. When the substance comes down, what happens to the spring? Spring gets elongated, isn't it? Correct. There also, same thing, same thing would happen. But what is the difference? The elongation is much stronger. Am I correct? Am I correct? Spring is elongated strongly. Much more strongly than in the case of paramagnetic. Got it? All of you understood? Now let me show you something now. This is like, uh, this is like, you know, we have a solenoid here. Look at this, solenoid here. He is going to introduce a core inside. See what happens to the core. Okay. And tell me whether it is diamagnetic, paramagnetic or ferromagnetic. Okay. So look at this and tell me. So it is now, this So this is a solenoid. Solenoid. Air core solenoid. Yeah. Not being something. Really, it isn't. It's air core solenoid, okay? I can't even do anything. But I'm a ferromagnetic, thank goodness. Now this one. It's being pulled in, right? It's being attracted, right? Must be either paramagnetic or ferromagnetic. Okay. Okay. It doesn't matter whether you have a cable there. The reason why they're lucky, because if that was not the case, this 15 kilogram file would go like a bullet coming out of you. So the one thing you don't want to do when it goes in there, you don't want to 
break the current because then it would come out of the boom. I'm not going to do that, believe me. But I want to show you that there you go. Amazing. It's being pulled in, right? Right. Okay. So this stays inside. So parallel you know, there's enormous force. It's the first thing I have to do is now I'll show you something else. Magnets. Look at this. So this is a solar. Look at this. Another one. That's like a solenoid. And we have a battery with a pair of neodymium magnets. These are called neodymium magnets. It'll automatically be pulled in, right? I'll tell you how it works in the next class, okay? Look at that. It'll keep moving around. I'll show you this in, in in class next time. Okay. I have the coil with me, the battery and near diamond magnets. Okay, I'll show that in the next class. Okay. All right, we are moving to the last part. This is a small derivation. That's the end of it. Okay. Look at this. I take a solenoid. I take a solenoid. All right. The solenoid's magnetic field, I'm writing. Magnetic field inside the solenoid is usually B0, right? I took it as mu zero ni. If you remember, do you remember this? Yeah. We took it as mu zero times ni, mu zero times h. All right. Imagine I'm introducing a core inside, maybe iron core. So in that case, there will be alignment of dipoles, right? Atomic dipoles. Am I correct? So that contributes to another term that is called mu zero times m dash. I'll tell you one more time. Look at this. The total magnetism inside the solenoid i repeat one more time what is the context we take a solenoid we take a solenoid now it is air called a solenoid air called a solenoid what is the magnetic field only this term mu zero ni correct the magnetic field is due to mu zero ni that is basically due to the current flowing am i correct but if i introduce an iron core inside there is another contribution Due to what? Due to the magnetism of that core. Correct. Don't you remember what we did in the beginning? Magnetism of that core. Do you remember this? Correct. That term was called M dash, right? Dipole moment per unit volume was called M dash, right? Correct. Magnetization. So I have to give one term that belongs to the core also, M dash. So let me complete this. This B will be called mu into H. Because B0 was called mu0 H, B will be called mu into H is equal to mu0 H plus mu0 into. Do you remember what chi was? Chi was m dash by H. Rows multiply m dash equal to what? Chi times H. Last step. Do you remember what epsilon was? Epsilon 0, epsilon R. This epsilon was called permittivity permittivity this is permittivity of free space or permittivity of vacuum this is relative permittivity right these terms belong to electricity whereas we have magnetism we have permeability permeability is what permeability of free space into relative permeability correct so this mu will be replaced with mu zero mu r h is equal to mu zero h plus mu zero chi h i'm done mu zero mu zero mu zero cut h h h cut and mu r is equal to from this term it is one plus chi that is the relation i was looking for relative permeability and chi susceptibility are related by mu r equal to one plus chi it was deleted but last year it got reinstated but i don't see a chance of this question coming in examinations but still we can't take risk all right mu r equal to 1 plus chi. In the morning, I did this three or four times. I'm going to do it again, you know, till you understand. Okay, mu r equal to 1 plus chi. Okay, remember one thing. Uh, for diamagnetic material, I said what? 
chi value is negative right chi value is negative right so for that mu r is less than 1 diamagnetic substance mu r is less than 1 if it is less than 1 for example imagine this is 0 0.5 0 0.5 get 1 to the left side 0 0.5 minus 1 minus 0 0.5 i had said that chi is negative for dia right correct i kept my word so chi is negative right chi is negative for diamagnetic all right so mu r values you must know mu r relative permeability is less than 1 for dia mu r is greater than 1 for para mu r is very very greater than 1 for ferro all right they won't ask numericals on this but instead just know the values that's it okay got it i'll do this one more time then i'll ask okay we'll write it again okay so look at this this is what we have a solenoid this is air cord solenoid air cord solenoid air cord solenoid has magnetic field what mu zero times h correct correct so that is basically due to the current flowing through this a current flows through this right correct when a current flows through this there is a magnetic field inside there is a magnetic field inside okay and right inside you are introducing an ion core all right ion core okay ion core so what will happen now the ion core has magnetism of its own am i correct that is also adding up to the magnetic field inside got it originally without the ion core you know it is simply mu zero h okay did you understand the context i'll do that one last one last time we take a solenoid 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 has a current passing through it so there is magnetic field inside i write the magnetic field this way mu zero times h then all of a sudden i'm introducing an ion core inside that will contribute its own magnetic field because all the atomic dipoles are aligned right correct what is the term that belongs to this particular concept look at that the alignment that is m dash right m dash right correct m dash was called magnetization all right so i am putting it here i am putting it here so i can put it the second term i can put it mu zero into m dash so the total magnetism is mu zero h plus mu zero m dash this is the total magnetic field inside the solenoid got it got it what is b now b i said is mu into h why is it mu into h because b zero is mu zero times h so b must be mu times h this is without the core this is with the core got it when there is a core that mu r will come there mu r will begin showing up got it now what the last step i i told you two things number one mu will be called mu zero into mu r this is what this is called permeability magnetic permeability this is permeability of free space. This is relative permeability. Got it? So I put it here. In place of mu, I put mu zero mu r h. This is mu zero h plus mu zero into, I'm writing it here. Look at this. I'm writing chi is equal to m dash by h. Do you remember this? Correct. So m dash may be replaced with chi into h. Last step, I write it one more time, mu zero mu r h is equal to mu zero h is common on right side. It is one plus chi. Mu zero mu zero cut h h cut u r getting mu r equal to one plus chi. All of you understood this? Got it? Everyone understood this? So this is what we take a solenoid solenoid a current is passing through the solenoid correct this creates a magnetic field inside the magnetic fields are lines like this are in lines like this right so i'm writing the magnetic field as what is a magnetic field mu zero times h magnetic field due to the external factor the current magnetic field due to the current flowing is mu zero times h then right inside you bring a core iron core okay so what happens it has atomic dipoles, right? It has atomic dipoles. So it has a magnetism that will contribute to the magnetic field inside the solenoid. Okay, there are two components basically. One is due to the external factor like current flowing through it. 
correct second one due to the internal magnetism of the core got it what is that term i can call it bm what is bm mu zero m dash because in the first slide see this the internal core thing no this thing the alignment we took the term as m dash magnetization then i put it back to here look at this that's like mu zero m dash so both of them together contribute to the magnetism so i can write the net magnetism is equal to contribution from current plus contribution from internal dipole arrangement got it so that will be mu h is equal to mu zero h plus mu zero m dash we make arrangement here mu zero mu r mu will be called mu zero mu r mu is permeability this is relative permeability permeability of free space into h is equal to mu zero h plus mu zero into chi was defined as m dash by h cross multiply now m dash h mu zero mu zero mu zero cut h h h cut you get mu r is equal to oh chi this is chi h sorry that's chi h mu r equal to one plus chi is that clear now so write this in the first column for dia second column is for para third column is for ferro just write this diamagnetic substance mu r value is less than 1 okay relative permeability is less than 1 for diamagnetic relative permeability is greater than 1 for paramagnetic relative permeability is very very greater than 1 in the order of thousands thousands few thousands for ferromagnetic okay one last thing temperature dependence we have to write it is not there in syllabus last year it got deleted but it still has a chance of coming. All right. I'm 100% sure in Birla school, they'll teach this. Okay. All right. So just write this down. Temperature dependence with susceptibility with temperature. Here, no dependence. Diamagnetic, no dependence. Paramagnetic, chi is equal to C mu zero by T. C has a name. It's all there in the notes. Curie constant. It's not there in the latest reader. As per the rationalized content, it is deleted. Chi is equal to C mu zero by T. What is chi? Susceptibility. Susceptibility is inversely proportional to temperature. Okay. C is called Curie constant. Mu zero is permeability. T is the temperature. Here it is C by T minus Tc. Where Tc is called Curie temperature. Curie temperature. C is called Curie. TC is called Curie, Curie temperature. All right. Okay. And write one note also. That's it. Finished. If T greater than TC, temperature is greater than Curie temperature, ferromagnetic substance turns into paramagnetic substance. So that's that point again. So, what is the dependence with the temperature? Again, say it again. Chi is equal to C mu zero by T. Paramagnetic. C is Curie constant. Mu is permeability. T is the temperature. And for ferromagnetic, chi is equal to C by T minus Tc. Tc is called Curie temperature. Above Curie temperature, ferromagnetic substance turns into paramagnetic. That is why when you heat the magnet, it will lose its magnetism. All right. In your school laboratory, your teacher asks you not to drop the magnet. Because when you drop the magnet onto the floor, there will be realignment of dipoles inside. So it will lose its magnetism. Or they will be randomly aligned. You know what happens when random alignment comes, right? Net will be zero, right? So you keep throwing a magnet to the floor so too many times, its magnetism will be lost. Or put it in an oven for some time. It will lose its magnetism. All right. The chapter stands completed, except for a small topic called domain theory of ferromagnetism. But that won't be coming in exams, but I'll be taking it in class. All right. Shall we wind up for the day?